Take your Bible, turn to Ch John chapter 12, if you would. John chapter 12. I had a good day studying today. I, I enjoyed it. Had a good time, me and the Lord. And um, I like to get on a rabbit trail and just chase rabbits all through the Bible. And that's what I was doing today. And there was a certain word that the Holy Ghost sort of laid in my heart. And I had, was in the process today of going through all the verses in the Bible that use this particular word. I won't tell you what it is yet. Um, but it's, it's something big is what it is. And um, I just like doing stuff like that. You, are, you will be surprised at the things that you will find in the Bible that you never thought were there. Phrases that we use all the time that actually came and derived from our King James Bible. You ever heard, hear somebody say, boy, he's the spitting image of his daddy. You ever, you ever heard that? You know what that derives from? The, in the spirit and image of God. It's a it's, they contract the word spirit, and he's a spitting image of his dad. You would literally be saying, this young man has the spirit and the image of his father. That's where that comes from. And I like little things like that, little nuggets like that, and to find them in your Bible, I really like that stuff. All right, John chapter 12, verse 9, are you there? Say amen. Um... Much of the people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. And we covered this last Wednesday. I'm just going to move forward from here. Lazarus is a celebrity now. His name has been passed around probably the entire nation of Israel. Have you heard that there is a man of God in Jerusalem that can heal somebody, heal lame people, heal blind people, and my goodness, this man even raised a man named Lazarus from the dead after he'd been dead four days. Some people believed it, some people didn't. But there's Lazarus sitting in Martha's house, eating and drinking with the rest of them, and that's living proof that he is alive. And so when the priests, the uh, Sanhedrin, the 70 elders of Israel, verse 10, the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. In other words, we don't care that he raised Lazarus from the dead. We don't care. The only thing we care about is maintaining the status quo so that us elders of Israel can keep receiving parts of the tithing that the Israelites were commanded by God to do. Walk around in these beautiful, ornate, religious robes, act like the religious people. Jesus said these guys, they love to be seen in the markets. They like for everybody to look upon their clothing. They love the fact that when they walk down the street, people bow to them. They like that. And as long as Lazarus is alive, nobody's going to bow to these hypocrites who are the elders and the leaders of Israel. So they consulted. That's a conspiracy. Remember that we talked about that last week. That's a conspiracy. The chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Did you see that? They left their old religion and they joined in with a new one. I want to use my hot dog stand analogy. I dreamed this up. Suppose that, um, suppose that I was a multi, multi billionaire. And, or my dad was. 
And when my dad died, he left all of the inheritance to me. So I've got $13 billion in the bank. Uh, I've got more money coming in every day because of investments. There's never going to be a day when I'm going to be in poverty. Never going to be that day. And the business that his father had was a hot dog stand on a street corner. And everybody that comes by, he talks to them and can, talks them into buying one of this guy's hot dogs. Saying to them, if you eat this, you'll feel better. If you eat this, it'll cure diseases. If you eat this, it will give you temporary salvation. Now you'll have to come back probably a week from now and eat another one to cover the sins that you committed last week. But all of these hot dogs here are for your salvation. Wow, that sounds good. And you start to reach in and grab one. The guy almost cut your hand off. What are you doing? Well, I'm going to give me a hot dog. Uh, listen, these things didn't come cheap. They're $49.95 plus $20 shipping and handling. 60 bucks, 70 bucks. The billionaire's son has received all of this money and all this inheritance. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. There's not anything that he needs. And he wants to give back to people. So he goes across the street, sets up a hot dog stand. And instead of selling the hot dogs, he gives them all away for free. Is the guy that's selling the hot dogs going to be really upset at the guy who across the street is giving away hot dogs? Because why would you buy something that you can get for free? Amen? I believe that the greatest power on earth is religious power because in the name of whatever God they worship in the name of that God those people believe that they can do anything to anybody because their God told them to do it we know and believe that our God is not the same as their God amen we know that and so we are a threat to them because we will never fall down and worship their God. Never going to happen. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, never happened. They said, we're not going to bow down to that. And they didn't. And when everybody fell, it's quite obvious who's on the Lord's side and who isn't. When you look out over the field and you see everybody laying down on their stomachs and three men standing up. Okay? They had already decided there's only one God for us. He's never left us. I'm not going to leave him. At some point, my hope and prayer is that everybody who hears my voice, at some point in your life, conviction settles on you and you get along with God and you say, God, Put this in me the way it should be so that I never walk away from you. Amen. So they want to kill Lazarus because Lazarus is living proof that Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah. Verse 11, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and I have the rest of that passage on here, so I'm going to move on. Uh, we talked about Ahithophel last Wednesday night, correct? Ahithophel? Okay. So I'm going to move on from there. Um, yeah, Nehemiah 4.7. We talked about this. Sanballat and Tobiah that were the enemies of the Jews. They hated the Jews. And um, I think this was Tyrus who set the Jews free from their captivity and gave them a, 
a piece of paper with his writing and his seal on it, allowing them free passage from Babylon to their home city of Jerusalem. And they had the king's authority to be able to walk out of Babylon and go to Jerusalem and rebuild it. Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, they represent the enemies of grace through faith. They represent the enemies of grace and faith for our salvation. And because their religion is making them huge prophets, they're going to have to do away with this Jehovah God of the, of the Jews. They're going to have to do away with that because it's a threat to them. So the Bible says in Nehemiah 4 verse 7, But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, why are they building a wall? Protection. Be, uh, began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth. We can't have that. And conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Boy, I'll tell you what. You're going to get up some Sunday here for too long. And the devil is going to pull out every weapon he's got to stop you from going to church. I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because it matches perfectly with what I'm talking about. There was a man here when my mom started bringing me and Melissa here. There was a man here by the name of Mike. And I liked him. My dad and Mike uh, became friends and they liked to rabbit hunt and I've been, was, had been out rabbit hunting with this man several times. He had a wife that was in this church. He had, um, he had two children at the time and then a third one was born. And I just looked up to this man. Thought the world of him. I saw him take up the offering. All kinds of things. Well, something happened. And I, you know, I'm young. I probably won't, did, you know, was not meant to hear anything about it. And I didn't. But all of a sudden, he's not coming to church anymore. And then I found out because his wife, and during prayer request time, she'd say, pray for Mike. Pray for my husband, Mike. He needs to get back right with God. And what Mike was doing was he was going back and visiting the old bars he used to go to. May, may have even been chasing women in those bars. Who knows? His wife didn't know because she didn't go to the bar with him. But all of a sudden he's gone. And we don't see him anymore. He's, he's not here ever again. And their family told us this story after Mike's funeral. They said the, the oldest daughter, the oldest child, I think their daughter was somewhere around 10 or 11 years old when this happened. Mike would lay in bed. His wife would get up, cook breakfast, get all the kids ready and take them to church. Now, years before, Mike was right along with them. But he would just lay in bed, act like he's asleep. One, one Sunday morning, his daughter went walking by their bedroom. And they noticed Daddy wasn't in bed. She saw her dad pull out his suit. It was a Sunday morning. He pulled out his suit. And was seriously considering going to church that morning. He laid that suit down on the bed. He looked at it for the longest time. Then he picked the suit up, put it back in the closet, shut the closet door, laid down, pulled the covers over his head, made it like he was asleep. Wasn't too long after that, that we got word that Mike was traveling down 110 Highway. Yet at night, in a very, very thick fog, foggy night, 
couldn't see the road, couldn't see anything. And they literally, piece by piece, dug the pieces of his brain out of the back seat of that car. That's how hard he hit whatever it was. I think it was the embankment. But he died just like that. Never knew what hit him. Drunk, drunk as a skunk. God was begging and pleading with this man. Get your heart right with God. Him standing there looking at his suit. He was ready to put that suit on and go to church with his family. But he decided not to. And I'm afraid that I know where he is. And it's not heaven. You will fight battles every day to do what's right. To say right things, to think right things, to look upon right things, holy things, clean things, not touch unclean things, not be defiled by what comes out of your heart. That happens a lot with us. We battle a battle every time God tells us to read our Bible. We come up with some excuse why we can't. God says, get up, go to church. Oh, little Amy, she, was, she had a runny nose this morning. I'm just afraid to get her out. Nah, you just didn't want to go to church. And that's what's happening here. They, they conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. It happens to me. On a Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, it happens to me when I can feel, literally feel the devil pulling me away. Mike, get out of that pulpit. Don't say those things. Don't preach that. I go through that a lot. Because the devil doesn't want me to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. So verse 8, on they conspired all of them together. To, verse 9, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Now, there's a, there's a sermon right there. Number one, when you're being compassed about with every devil, make your prayer to God. You can't kill them. No spirit has ever been shot by Joe Biden's AR-14 rifle. Some, yeah, you'll get that later. Yeah, okay. No, he can't. Um, I, I think it would be interesting if we could see how Joe Biden eats every day. I can see his wife tying his bib around this shirt so we don't slobber food all down the front of his shirt. Because I think that's about as the much the mentality you guys got. But anyway, we made a prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Listen, you might think that when the devil leaves you alone, oh, praise God, I finally made it. The devil's never going to come back on me again with this. Yeah, he is. Yes, he is. Jeremiah 11, verse 9. Let's see here. Where did I where did I leave off? I think Ezekiel 22. Turn there. There is a conspiracy. Verse 25. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof like a roaring lion. Ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they shewed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. He's talking about his preachers. If God would allow you to see inside the heart of every preacher in the Festus Crystal City area, you would probably walk away and say, those men are evil. And I will tell you, there's a bunch of them that are. 
Roy, what did you say tonight when you came in about the Southern Baptist Convention? Find all these pedophile preachers who are preying on the children of their own church. Mm -mm -mm. Um, verse 26, her priest have violated my law and profane. I've already read that. Um, look at verse 27. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening to prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, saying, van seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord, ha God, Lord hath not spoken. So let me run something by you real quick. Do you believe... Well, which one can I pick? Do you believe that a famous television preacher had a meeting with Jesus and Jesus was so distraught that he started crying and this TV preacher pulled him over to his shoulder and said, Jesus, don't worry, I got you. Do you believe that happened? No, it's a joke. That's evil stuff, amen. But that's, that, is, that is all around us, these guys. And God knows their heart. And they're building up the walls of their churches with mortar that won't stick together. The lime has not been uh, heated up, it's not been cooked. That wall is going to come tumbling down. And when it does, it's going to expose all the lies that those preachers told throughout their life. It's going to expose them for who they really are. John chapter 12. Um, let me get here and give you the t context of this. John chapter 12. Let's see here. By the way, we are moved in. And we still got boxes unopened still. Um, John chapter 12, uh, let's look at verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, we pick it up in verse 13, that's what's on the screen, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, I think, if I remember right, I think I asked you, what was the symbolism of them having palm branches in their hands? Why does the Bible, number one, have to mention that? Is it, is it important? If it's in the Bible, it's important. I mean, you just must settle that right now. If it's in the Bible, God has a really good reason for it to be there. But all these people, they see Jesus riding in on this donkey... And these people are celebrating him as their king and they're waving palm branches in their hands. You know what they're doing. Did anybody look into that last week? Come on, Gary. I thought for sure you'd just take it and run with it, right? Oh, man, that's a mark against every one of you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look at verse at 14. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. This was said a thousand years before Jesus ever showed up. This was said. Man, I love that. How is it that that prophet, a thousand years before Christ ever did this, how was it that he knew that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, which was going to be the capital of his kingdom, that when he came in, he would come in riding on a donkey? How did Isaiah know that? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Uh, verse 16, these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him. 
Now, and that they had done these things unto him. Now, I'm going to say something about those who spend a lot of time studying Bible prophecy. You have an example right here where Jesus pretty much plainly told them what was going to happen. And because it hadn't happened yet, they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about, what Isaiah was talking about. They didn't understand it. But when they saw it, and after he died, and they're sitting, you know, the disciples in there talking and said, Oh, you remember when he came into Jerusalem? He was riding on the, uh, the, uh, a donkey? Yeah, I remember that. I, well, I was reading in the Old Testament the other day. I found that verse. And Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. And they're all getting happy. Amen. But they didn't understand it fully until after it happened. And this is my point on this. Anybody who tries to tell you that they are some big prophecy expert. They're just puffing themselves up. They say they've got it all figured out. Generally, they will make teachings on it. They will write books about it. They will make DVDs or videos or whatever. And they want to sell you those things. They will tell you, oh my goodness, you need this teaching. You will not be able to make it through life and make it into eternity until you have this teaching. And then the guy comes on and says, you can have this teaching for your love offering of $49.95 plus $20 shipping and handling. Here's my point. There's a lot of things in this Bible that I absolutely believe 100% they're true. But they haven't happened yet. And because they haven't happened yet, I can't fully picture nor fully, fully realize how it's all going to play out. I don't, I can't see that. But I do trust the book. I trust it. And so prophecy is best understood either at the time it's fulfilled or shortly after it's fulfilled. I mean, Gary, didn't Jesus tell his disciples that one of them was a traitor? And they're all looking at each other. Who's the traitor? Jesus knew who it was. And Judas knew who it was. Nobody else did. But after the cross. And they're told that Judas is hanging by a rope by his neck out in the field called Akeldama. The field of blood. And apparently, and eventually, I know this is gross, but he's hanging there on a rope. And after about five or six days, it's not the rope that breaks. The tissue is dissolved and it just collapses into a great big giant vat of jello. Because that's about what it ends up being. It's best understood after it happens or while it's happening. But we can still believe and trust. That if God said he's going to do it this way, he's going to do it exactly that way. Amen? Amen. These things understood not as disciples at the first. But now they understand it. Genesis 33. What is the, what is the palm branches? Do you know what? I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you where I'm going. This is already after 8 o'clock. But I'm going, to go, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I think about this. And I know the verse, no man knoweth the day or the hour in which the Son of Man cometh. But I also know some other verses. For yet seven days and I will destroy the world. God told Noah exactly how long it would be before it would start raining. He said, no, you got seven more days. What do you think happened on day seven? God himself closed the door of the ark. Nobody gets out, nobody gets to come in, and sure enough, the rains began to fall, and the floods came up, the rains came down, and the floods came up. This is exactly what happened. Okay? So, I think the Bible gives us clues. In John chapter 16, we'll study this in depth when we get to it. 
But the Holy Spirit clearly is, has the job of showing us Bible believers, Jesus said it this way, things to come. If you want to understand prophecy, don't read some bozo's book that you find at Amazon.com and certainly don't watch some idiot's videos on YouTube. Oh, I tried to point at him. I don't know nothing. But I trust God. I trust His Word. So now watch this. I think this is a clue. Genesis 33. Genesis 33 is the reunion of Esau and Jacob. Now, they'd been apart all this time because Jacob stole his birthright and uh, had his inheritance. And Esau was going to kill his brother, Jacob. If I, if I ever see him, I'm going to kill him. Well, time has passed. And the older we get, sometimes we forget how bad we hate people. Or we get to a place in life where we've been feuding for years and we get to a place in life where we say, what was it all about anyway? Amen? So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir and Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. What does the word Sukkoth mean? Just take a guess. It is the Hebrew word for booths. So there is a there is a high feast day. Three times a year, God ordered every male to travel, no matter where they were from, to travel to Jerusalem and celebrate, number one, the Passover. Number two, the Feast of Weeks. And number three, the... Um, Feast of Tabernacles. Let me give you a little word study. The word tabern in tabernacle derives from the word tavern. It does. Now, when we think of a tavern, what is a tavern in our thinking? Roy, what's a tavern? Bar. Bar. But for thousands of years, they didn't use the word that way. This is back before the days of Holiday Inn, Motel 6, Trump Towers. This is before all of that. And if you were traveling and taking a long journey, your hope was that you could make it to a certain village or city where more than likely they would have a tavern there. And you go in with a few shekels, they'll give you a meal, give you something to drink, and they've got a room for you where you can sleep in the bed. They've got a stable for your horses and camels out there. You pay them the money, you get a night's rest, and then early in the morning you get up, get a little breakfast in you, and you take off to the next city. See, that word tavern or tavern literally implies that it's temporary. Now I want you to think of this tabernacle. Is it permanent? It's temporary. It's temporary. So that's where the word tabernacle comes from. The, the house that Moses built, it doesn't exist anymore. The temple that Solomon built does not exist anymore. The temple that they built after their exile in Babylonian captivity, that temple doesn't exist anymore. They were temporary dwelling places for God. Okay? And... And I got, I got to get through this. Uh, verse 18, And when Jacob came to Shalem, do you know what the city of Shalem is? Take a wild guess. Jerusalem. He was in Salem. The city of God. No, what does Shalom mean? City of peace. Amen. 
So he came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and he called it El Elohi Israel. Which that word, it's easy to break down that word. El means God. Elohi means God. Israel, of course, means the, the tribe of Israel, the people of Israel. And what this name is, is that our Lord is the God of Israel. Amen. And so, does anybody here know who created Superman in the comic books? Does anybody know the names of the two guys who created the character of Superman? Huh? They were. Jerry Siegel and Joel Schuster. They were two Jewish men. And I, listen, I'm telling you, they studied the Kabbalah and they knew exactly what they were doing in there. Because the family name that Superman came from on the planet Krypton, the word Krypton means secret, cryptic, like cryptography. And they created this character who, on the planet Krypton, came from the house of El. Superman was Cal El, and his father was Jor El. And listen, those two guys, they were Jews. And they put in Jewish socialist theosophy, theology in there. You can see it. Okay? But anyway, I gotta move on. I, I gotta show you the, the booths here. The palm branches. What's so significant? Uh, Revelation. Let's see, is this where I want? No. It's not what I want. Go to, uh, Revelation chapter 7. And why isn't that in my notes? Let's see here. No. No. I don't have it in my notes. What did I do wrong? Revelation chapter 7. In verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. What did they have? They had in their hands exactly the same thing that the believers of Jerusalem had in their hands when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem. For you see, when Jacob built those booths in Succoth, he used, you know, logs for the framework, but he used palm branches for the walls and the ceiling, the roof. There is a high feast day, and it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. And in the law... God specifically said, take ye of the palm branches. And there was a couple other things they could use. And build ye booths and dwell in them for seven days. And if you'll do that, I will come in and be there with you. And I will be your God and ye shall be my people, saith the Lord. That's the symbolism of it. So here's Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And they're waving palm branches. You know what they're doing? They're foreshadowing a future event. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is the, it's the unfulfilled prophecy. Passover was all about slaying the lamb and using the lamb's blood as protection against the destroyer. And when did Jesus offer himself as the lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world to protect his people from the death angel? When did Jesus do that? At Passover. Jesus fulfilled the meaning of Passover at Passover. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And then you have the Feast of Weeks, 
where 49 days, and then on the 50th day, they have the, the harvest, the ingathering. And lo and behold, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came down. So here's God fulfilling another feast, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of the Harvest. And he does it exactly on the Jewish calendar, the exact day that he told them that they were to celebrate this feast. The Holy Ghost comes down on all of them and makes all of them fruitful. Right? So the Feast of Tabernacles. If you study all the Gospels, you will not find a fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. But God's word cannot be broken. And if it's a prophecy, it's going to happen. And I absolutely believe that Christ is going to come down and he's going to dwell with his people and we are going to dwell with him forever and ever and ever and ever. In fact... Here we are in Revelation 7. Me, you, 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 you. We're all in the same place. And what are we holding in our hands? Palm branches. Why? Because we're fulfilling the Feast of Tabernacles. We're literally, we're going to sup with Christ. Amen.